Blue Eye. Yeah, I was asking. I'm actually getting my my Andre on. I got my actual script out tonight. I'm looking at the script. Normally, I'm just looking at the computer, but um, I've got my actual Bible out tonight, so I'm gonna be following along on my Bible, taking notes, and I wanted to make sure I went back because um, we we touched on some stuff, so I could add those notes to my to my Bible. Um, I think it's gonna get heavy tonight. Hallelujah! Um, ain't nothing. You know, I'm old school uh, like that too, Aki. Like, I always had a, the scriptures up on the screen as well, but I just don't feel right without a physical book in front of me. You know, plus I take notes in the Bible, so I need to be able to write into it. You know what I mean? So, hallelujah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, like this Bible I have here, man, I'd be lost if I lost this, you know, any Bible. But this particular one, I would be lost because it's full of notes that I haven't been able to transfer to other places. And I'm one of them people to where I just hate when I forget a point. But we did this last time. Um, we stopped at chapter 15 and it was after, you know, the fallen angels have done what they did. Enoch is starting to travel through the uh, heavens in a vision. It's key that we remember that as this starts, he's just having visions of the heavens. He has not been what we would call translated or even that concept hasn't come up yet. Keep that in mind. Um, He's been to a, 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 a kind of like a dark place. He's like in an in-between place where he's talked to the fallen angels. They know the judgment has come from Yah and they've asked him to pray. And we read through Abba Yah responding to him, to them um, in verse 15 or in chapter 15. Um, and I believe chapter 16 is a continuation of that. Even though we stopped here, I thought 15 was the end of it. So um, I'm going to read 15 to start. This is Abba Yah's response to Enoch for the fallen angels asking him to pray once again. Um, it says, oh, let me make this a little bigger. I'm sorry. There we go. But he raised me up and said to me with his voice, Enoch or Hanak, I heard, do not fear Hanak, righteous man, scribe of righteousness. Come near to me and hear my voice, and tell the watchers of Shemaim on whose behalf you have been sent to intercede. That's just a heavy statement to even think about it. The watchers needed a man <laughs> to go intercede. Like, that's just beyond my comprehension. It is meet for you that you intercede on behalf of man. So the first thing y'all says is, y'all out of order even for that. You got the nerve to send a man to intercede and you down there playing like me and you supposed to be interceding on their behalf, right? And not man on your behalf. For what reason have you abandoned the high, holy and eternal Shemaim and slept with women and defile yourselves with the daughters of the people, taking wives, acting like the children of Aretz and begetting Nephilim or giant sons? Surely you, you used to be Kodesh, Ruwakwa, <laughs> the living ones possessing eternal life, but now you have defiled yourselves with women and with the blood of the flesh begotten children. You have lusted with the blood of the people, like them producing blood and flesh, which die and perish. On that account, I have given you wives in order that seeds might be sown upon them and children born by them, and children born by them which is an interesting concept because I, I kind of seen that last week and I never thought about that. Did the giants actually have children? That's, that's something that's beyond me. I never really thought about that. So that the deeds that are done upon the earth will not be withheld from you. Indeed, you formerly, you were of the Ruach, having eternal life and immortal and all the generations of the world. That is why formerly I did not make wise for you for the dwelling of the spiritual beings of Shemaim and Shemaim. You didn't need children because you don't die. I gave man children to further his lineage and to pass down the knowledge from generation to generation to get better because they pass away. And this is how, this is how I'm allowing them in a sense to be eternal because man was originally created eternal, right? So I've done that. So even though he through sin, he'll die now. 
the closest he'll get to being eternal is he gets to pass his lineage down to a seed, right? But you didn't need that because you were eternal. You still of the heavenly um, order, for lack of a better word. And I'll be I also let it be known, I allowed you to do that. And, you know, there's scriptures that talk about I'll be I leaving us to um, our own heart, our own decisions. And a lot of times it's like, don't do that, I'll be I, because we understand that the heart is wicked and so on and so forth. So that's that's actually fulfilling things that we know in scripture, different principles that I'll be I have. I'll leave you to your own mind then. But typically when he says that, matter of fact, I can't think of no other time in scripture, whenever you've seen I'll be I say that, it's typically a bad thing to be left to your own thoughts and your own decisions. You, you And it shows that even the angels, when I do that, you're gonna err. But now the giants who are born from the union of the spirits and the flesh shall be called evil spirits upon the earth because their dwelling shall be upon the earth and inside the earth. Interesting. Evil Ruachs have come out of their bodies because from the day that they were created from the holy ones, they became the watchers. Their first origin is a spiritual foundation. They will become evil upon the earth and shall be called evil spirits. The dwelling of the spiritual beings of Shemaim is Shemaim, but the dwelling of the Ruachs of Aretz, which are born upon Aretz, is in Aretz. The spirits of the giants oppress each other. They will corrupt, fall, be excited, and fall upon the earth and cause sorrow. They eat no food, nor become thirsty, nor find obstacles. And these Ruachs shall rise up against the children of the people and against the women, because they have proceeded forth from them. And then chapter 16 is a continuation of that. Abiyah says, from the days of the slaughter and destruction and the death of the giants and the spiritual beings of the Ruach and the flesh, from which they have proceeded forth, which will corrupt without incurring judgment, they will corrupt until the day of the great con conclusion. So he's saying these, these, these spirits of these giants that y'all having, because they're not of heaven and they really not of earth, they're gonna become the demons. I'm gonna force them to roam the earth and they're gonna, they gonna trick people and they're gonna be doing all kind of wickedness. And I'm once again gonna allow them that because they're gonna be judged with you in the end, right? And he's telling them, they're going to do that until the great conclusion. They're going to be here until the end, right? I think that's important because we always hear people now say, you know, this is a demon and a demon on him. And I'm praying these demons off. Now we understand who these demons are. These demons are the Ruachs of the giants that were born between humans and heavenly beings that Abiyah has forced to roam the earth without rest, without peace until the very end, right? until the great age is consummated, until everything is concluded upon the watchers and the wicked ones. And so to the watchers on whose behalf you have been sent to intercede, who were formerly in Shemaim, say to them, you were once in Shemaim, but not all the mysteries of Shemaim are open to you. That's interesting. The angels are in the Shemaim, yet I didn't open everything to them and um, on the call I do with my family, we just read in John a part of this where I was like, I've given the prophets the understanding of the coming of the Son of Man and, you know, his moves and the things he'll do and say. I didn't even tell the angels that. So once again, I keep speaking about this difference between man and the angels because Abiyah from the very beginning has are, is already saying, I've created man to set him over the angels and man's fall. He became less than the angels, but still there are men who I choose, who I've put in positions that no angel has ever been in. And I say hallelujah to that. You were once in Shemaim, but not all the mysteries of Shemaim are open to you. And you only know the rejected mysteries. Interesting. Those ones you have broadcast to the women. And we went through that couple, uh, two weeks ago, how they taught weapons of war and the cutting of roots and um, I don't even remember everything they taught, but they taught astrology, different sciences, alchemy. They taught these things. He says, those ones you have broadcast to women in the hardness of your hearts. And by those mysteries, the women and men multiply evil deeds upon the earth 
Tell them, therefore, it's a powerful statement for Abi to tell you that. Can you imagine? And I'm not going to ask you to imagine Akifa had me imagining this, these terrifying things, but the thought of Abiyah personally telling you, you will never find peace. That's so scary. But I stop right there. Hallelujah. If there's any questions or comments about Abiyah's response to Enoch to go and tell the fallen angels, go ahead, Lauren. It's amazing about his response. Um, it's just sad, really. <laughs> I mean, it's sad, but at the end of the day, you already know that um, that division is there. And when we see the children of Hasatan, they have nowhere to go. They have nowhere to go. They're stuck here, and they're stuck here with man. And it makes you think of Luke when you see Hamas Yaks in there casting out the demons. And these people are sick with infirmity, and infirmities when Yahushua come on the scene. And they are so sick, and, the, and you have the man that's driven, that's cutting himself. But listen to all those key things, cutting yourself, um, having a love for, um, you know, just wickedness. Every person that had an infirmity, yes, we know it's tied to the demons. But the, the evil rocks that were sent out, we see them traces, just like my sister um, Mira had just pointed out. You see their children later on um, within the earth. And she had mentioned basically like, hey, they are the children, which they are. And the children, we, you see that Joshua, he's there with the children of Israel. They're pushing these people out. Yah's telling them constantly, these people are not, get rid of them. Do not be friends with them. They will become a snare unto you. And I do believe that the people that they spoke of was not people. I mean, personally, that's what I believe. I believe that they were people, but they were descendants of not just something of earth, but of something mixed with evil and spirit. And by, by them being upon the earth, they had to go. And do I believe that they survived? Do I believe the DNA is here today? Yes. I would say it with a straight face, yes. And when someone be like, well, do you believe that they were stomped out completely? No. And I want to know how everybody else felt about that as well. Because the spirits that we have today, yes, they are around. Yes, they do possess people. But some of these people, I do believe, are the direct descendants of, of some of them that we didn't, that was not completely killed out or wiped out off the land. Hallelujah. Now, and you're right, Akyar, makeup as well, they taught, um, which is something that people lust after, right? Uh, uh, um, when you see a woman with, with her makeup done nice, that's something that will, as my Akifa did a few weeks ago in his lesson, that's something that will drive a person's desire just because of the beautifying of a person's face. Um, you get lust from that type of thing as well. When it comes to, now, when it comes to the children um, of the giant, of the demons, so now there's a story in the Testament of Solomon. I'm not going to pull that up because I got a feeling we're going to end up reading through that maybe when we finish this because a lot of it kind of ties to this. But Solomon's talking to a demon and one of the demons told him that he could turn himself into a man and that he was knocking up daughters of men. And he went so far as to say that when they would bear his children because their bodies wasn't fit for it, that it would kill them. He told Solomon that like, women have died having my children. So yes, um, could some of the giants be like pregnancies from these evil spirits? And I stutter when I say it, cause it's just like, it's just an idea that's beyond me, possibly. Um, I also think there's other way, other ways where some of the giants on this planet, like I said, I believe that some of them have the Canaanite DNA. And the reason I believe that is because Cain, Cain Canaan is a son of Noah's wife. And she was, uh, I know in some of the other books, they say she was like five, 600 years old as well at the flood. And I believe that her DNA having been fully grown pre-flood, that DNA could possibly still produce a giant post-flood because I believe that Noah and his wife were bigger than Shem 
Ham and Jay and Yefef because they were all a hundred years or less at the time of the flood, which in terms of the flood and people living to be 900 years old, a hundred years old, as hard as it is to believe in our day and time, pre-flood to be a hundred years old, you're like a teenager. <laughs> you're, you're like a baby. A lot of people believe the Rockefellers and Morgans and some of those families are of Canaanite DNA. Aki, I agree. So it's, it's multiple ways that I believe giants, and this is, this is I, I, I usually don't give my opinion, but this is one opinion that I'll give tonight. There's multiple ways that giants could have could be on the planet today, um, but I agree um, with everything that's been said so far. And I think that's one of the great mysteries, you know, because scripture, I'll be, I say is that I killed everything that walked upon the earth. Now, it's understood that the fallen angels can perch in the, in the firmament. So the ones who wasn't, because we also realized in going through so far, every fallen angel didn't partake in this with these women. So the ones who didn't, they probably were perched in the firmament watching this happen. But the giants couldn't do that. And it says that everything that walked on the earth and breathed air died. So that's one of those great mysteries. You know, like I say, I gave my opinion. I'm not standing on that. I'm open for all opinions. But there are multiple ways, you know, there's multiple thought processes to how these giants got here. Um, and I'm open to any of them, actually. I don't have a firm grip. I just have a belief. Um, Akoti, Lauren, and Yahakana. I'll make it quick. All right, so we go to, let's see, it. you know, like when I was a kid, you hear all these scary stories, especially in the South. They always got a story for you, especially all the elders. They always got some crazy story. And I never forget uh, my grandmother, she was somewhat like Indian. So she told a story about, you know how the Indians was here with their tribes. And she said, you know, when people would come up and they was from other tribes, they say, show me your hands, show me your feet. And they'd be like, why, why am I showing you my hands and showing you my feet? They'd be like, you're not human. If they did not show their hands or their feet, they would brush them out easily. They'd be like, no, you can't come in here. And I used to laugh, like, what does that mean? You know, and my mom was like, because some people, when you see the deformity, of the six fingers and the six toes. My grandmother told me that. And she said, when you really look at it, it's like a mark. And I was like, why would you say that? Go to 2 Samuel 21, verse 20. And it says, and there was just yet a battle in Gath, where it was a man of great stature that had on every hand, six fingers and on every foot, six toes, 24 in number. And he also was born to the giants. Now today, fast forward. You can go on Google, just put six fingers and six toes. It's in every race. Holly Berry got six toes. You have Oprah, she got six. Oh. And it's funny because it's a tag, it's almost like a stamp. And then when you go to First Chronicles chapter 20, verse six, he said, and yet again, there was a war in Gath. And there was a man, great statue, who fingers and toes was um, four and 20, 24. Six on each hand, six on each foot. If you just hit Google real quick, put six fingers, six toes, you can put for any, um, you can even put for uh, people in high statue, people in lower statue. They're out here by the numbers and they're in every race. They're in black. Every group has one, at least a few people with six fingers and six toes. And to me, I've always looked at that as being almost like a stamp in their DNA. Hallelujah. I have a friend who has six toes. I definitely know what you mean. And it's like it jumped generations, different, different, like every other generation and the men in their family, they all have a six toe. So it's definitely um, around. Uh, I go to show you how these DNAs them been mixed as well. Um, that also goes to show why, you know, I'll be, I would speak about certain lineages and, um, you just have to be careful with who you're dealing with, you know, because you don't want to be mixed into one of these DNAs, um, especially Canaanite, I should say, uh, specifically is the one that I know for sure that Abba Yah really disdained was the Canaanite. Um, I kind of changed my approach towards Esau because the more you dig into Job or Job being Esau, Abba Yah loved Job. So I can't just say all oh, Esau was something that Abba Yah hated. It's another reason why I'm not going to allow nobody to tell me that all Esau is white people either. You feel me? 
because he loved Job and he was Esau, if we believe that, you know what I mean? But when it comes to a Canaanite, I can't think of any Canaanite in scripture that Abiy ever had any love for. It was always kill all of them. <laughs> so, you know, th these are just these are just the things, you know, that that that, that um I humbly say all that, that. I feel like those are the things that excite me actually because it just lets us know that, or I should say not us because you all may notice, but it, it it humbles me and always lets me know that there is always so much more to be learned in these scriptures never get complacent and i say that to myself but i say that to all of you as well never get complacent it's on you you so okay. hello everybody i just had a thought and this is just a thought just passing um as you were reading and you were talking about how the spirits would not be allowed to die the spirits would become evil spirits on the earth and I thought it made me think about something we read last week when and I'm not sure if it was Mir or who it was that brought up the question about could spirits inhabit uh do, would they take on different forms what is was it just people or was it uh animals and that sort of thing we had gotten into that and then I thought about what you were saying about the uh the ark if the father killed all of the the giants then all that would be left was evil spirits and if an evil spirit as you read in the testament of solomon could take on the form of a human man or to that to that point could he take could he have taken on the form of an animal as well because we know spirits can jump in anything they can host anything um is it possible that that those evil Ruachs jumped into some of those animals and that's how they were able to come back on the earth. Uh, Just a thought. I'm going to say no, they didn't jump in any of the animals on the ark because I don't believe I'll be out with allowed it. But with that being said, we know post flood, they definitely could jump in animals because Legion asked Yahushua to purposely put him in a pig. Right, exactly. I see you, Ark. So I'm going to just say no for the animals on the Ark because I believe Abiyah was making everything on there purposely. He was overseeing that everything there was Kodesh. But post-flood, without question, is possible. Um, and it's like I say, once again, it's just one of those things. You know, it's, it's, it's just go to that. That's just another one of them things that let us know we, we still got a lot of studying to do. It's on you, Ark Kiefer. Facts. And there's a couple of like there's a couple of things that has to be taken into consideration when we're trying to, you know, figure out about giants, right? Because you know, literally the giant story can go two different ways, maybe three different ways um, of what they actually were. One is that um, they were their lifespan was capped at 500 years. And if if you're taking the stance that you know that happened in genesis 6 you know and noah's alive at that time it you know and we know that you know from some of the extra biblical books we know that noah was younger than his wife that means that his wife was already alive and she lived 500 years so when is the culmination of that 500 years that you know their lifespan was capped that's number one um, number two, um, the Nafal or the fallen ones, um, if I'm not mistaken, and I'm just going off the top of my head, they were bound um, for 70 generations, right? Um, how long are we saying those 70 generations were? And, you know, it's possible with the information. Um, now, what I will say may have made its way onto the ark was some of the information that was given by the watchers to mankind information and if we remember when we first started eat, reading Enoch we talked about them being taught magic and spells and things of that nature um so you have to you know weave all of this together because it's very possible um that these these magical spells and incantations and cutting of roots and things that they were taught 
may make one's human body um, conducive to being able to um, have consummation from a, a rock or being, right? And, and, and that information could have made it to Nimrod because you start seeing, you know, watcher-like activity happening around Nimrod. So there's, there's, um, there's a lot of different ways that this story could go. There's a lot of different ways that um, giants could have showed up post-flood. Um, and, you know, all of those things have to be taken into consideration. I think a Jubilee speak, speaks of a stone um, being left that had some of that information on it. So, you know, I just, I just wanted to throw those points out there. I agree. It, I, can, I, I totally agree. It's, it's just one of them things, you know, it's, it's, it's many a ways that we could think of um, that that got on the flood. And to your point about the, the five, the cap of the 500, I don't even know if it was capped that high. I think they were more so asking why can't our children grow to be that old? It might've been capped at 200, you know? Um, and the chat, they're talking about the wives of Noah's sons. Uh, the belief is the wives of Noah's sons were all daughters of Enoch, but I would have to dig deeper into that to say that for sure. Um, right. I may be mixing the book of the giants and, and with some of this, which is a completely different book. Um, I think they like intercede each other, if I'm not mistaken. They go hand in hand. Um, all of these, you know, the book of Enoch, the book of the giants, like they, they go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. True. I've never read the book of the giants. Um, and to Mir's point, I, I, once again, I don't believe anything. I don't want to say corruptible because man has been corruptible since the fall, but anything that was just outright wicked made it on the ark. And to Ox point, I do believe that there were teachings of certain things that made it on there. And that kind of explains some of Ham's behavior when they come off. Cause when you timeline the way Ham starts acting post flood, like it's within like five years, Ham is already, if you timeline it up, I want to say it's within seven years when Ham does what he does with his mother. It's not like a hundred years go by and everything was cool. Like it's like immediately these demons and plus you got the demons around teaching, reteaching certain things. So. Right. Um, and if we take in a stance that Noah's wife was uh, Nehemiah, I think I sent you the video on that one. And, you know, that's a whole nother can of worms, but. And she was a daughter of Enoch as well. Right. Um, some believe, just to give you a, a brief, I think I sent you the video. Some believe that um, she may have been the mother to a lot of these or to some of the important um, ones, important of these beings. So, maybe. and it's a whole, it's a whole layout for that. No, maybe. I mean, once she has the children with Ham, which would be Canaan, um, that DNA is present. So post-flood I'm talking, I don't know if you're talking pre-flood, but post-flood, that opens that door. I mean, Goliath, I believe, and like Ognem, if I'm not mistaken, those nations they were under were Canaanite nations, I believe. So, you know, it's like I say, it's one of those things. Uh -huh. Hallelujah to everybody comments. That's why we're here, though, because this is one of those type of books. Um, but as we move on, as you see, the title says Enoch tours Earth and Sheol. So I believe when he's having this interaction with Yah and these angels, he's in the firmament. And now we're going to begin his journey of when he's going to start detailing things. Um, just so we all on the same page. Uh, somebody want to read chapter 17, eight verses? Okay. Oh, okay. Never mind. No, 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 no. Go ahead. I mean, you can read it. Go ahead. Okay. I mean, I'll go. It's okay. And they lifted me up into one place where there were the ones like the flaming fire. And when they so desired, they appear like men. And they stop, stop, took me stop. into I'm right sorry. there. He already saying, and they lifted me up into one place where there were ones like flame and fire. And we know that in Hebrews, it says, 
who created the spirit and the angels like flame and fire. So we know he, we're talking about an heavenly being. Um, this Psalms 104.4 next to it might even say that deep. To the side, you're going to notice there are like precepts to a lot of this. Um, as I've read through this, I've went through some of these. Some of these be accurate. Some of them be off. But in reading some of these, they have given me ideas of other scriptures. I know to where they have helped me veer off into other scriptures that you can precept a lot of this. A lot of, um, and I, I, for sake of time, I don't do this in here, but a lot of this Enoch and, and more so the other ones than this one, but some with this one as well, you can precept a lot of this back to the scripture. Um, but it's, 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 it, it's not always just as simple as a precept. Sometimes you have to define different things Hebraically for it to all fall together. So it's, 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 it's not a simple task. It's, um, it's a worthy task if you have the time and if you choose to. Uh, but some of these scriptures next to these do apply to some things. And just what I'm saying about these flaming fires, these are heavenly beings. And he's saying, and when they so desire, they appear like men. So that kind of goes to the point of you know, as we get to going on, or I shouldn't even say heavenly, these are supernatural beings, I should say. Like a demon, uh, although it has an earthly mother, it still would have a supernatural um, part to it because it's part heavenly being. But sorry to cut you off. Go ahead. No, you good. And they look, I'm sorry. And they took me into a place of whirlwind in the mountain, the top of its summit was reaching into heaven. And I saw chambers of light and thunder in the, ult in, sorry, in the ultimate end of the depth toward the place where the bow, the arrow and the quiver and the fiery sword and all the lightning were. And they lifted me up into the waters of life unto the um, occidental fire, which receives every setting of the sun. And I came to the river of fire, which flows like the water and empties itself unto the great sea in the direction of the west. And I saw all the great rivers and reached to the great darkness and went into the, I'm sorry, and went into the place where all flesh must walk cautiously. And I saw the mountains of the dark storms of the rainy season and from where the waters of all the seas flow. And I saw the mouths of all the rivers of the earth and the mouth of the sea. Well, he's been taken to a place. Um, I'm assuming he's on the earth. It says, and they took me into a place of a whirlwind in the mountain. The top of its summit was reaching unto Shemaim. That's interesting. <laughs> this is, this is, uh, wherever this place is, it's not, um, they don't teach about this mountain in school, I'm going to say. <laughs> and it says, I saw the chambers, right? The ultimate end of depth toward the place where, toward the place with the bow, the arrow, and their quiver and fiery sword, and all the lightnings are. So he's talking about, I assume here he's talking about, um, storehouses um, where Yah calls for certain things to be released up on the earth. He can see it from the top of this mountain. He, he can see these places, right? He says he came to a river of fire, which empties into the great sea. That almost kind of reminds me of like a volcano or something, lava. And he's seeing it being emptied into the great sea in the direction of the West. Um, I'm not exactly sure where he would be on the on 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 our reds at the time, so I don't exactly know where the West would be. Maybe one of you have a better idea. Um, and he said he reached a great darkness. It's almost like he's going down now in the place where all flesh walk cautiously. And they also have these notes here at the bottom. And same difference. Some of the times these notes be on, some be off. But what I liked here on this note, it said, in agreement with the Greek. So. Remember we read, they said they believe that this was written in Hebrew, but there are Greek fragments of it as well. And it says in the Greek, it reads where no flesh can walk. So I'm assuming they're talking Sheol, right? The flesh goes into the earth and then I guess the, maybe the Ruach is what's held 
in Sheol, and then in the end, the Ruach is going to come back into the flesh, and Yah is going to raise people. Is what I see as an idea here. I'm not, you know, I haven't fleshed that out. That's just what I see as an idea. And I saw the mountains of the dark storms and the rainy seasons, and from where the waters of the seas flow. We know there's water under the earth. And I saw the mouths of all rivers of the earth and the mouth of the sea. So he's he's starting to detail his journey of the earth as he's going down into Shio. Um, any questions or comments anybody want to add? I see you. Uh, what's this in the text? Um, you and Lauren both put scriptures in the text. Um, go ahead. That's where it mentions the 500 years. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. And it may be different in each translation. Um, like one will say one thing, one will say another, but supposedly it's Enoch 10, 9 through 12. Okay. I, I knew we went through it. I couldn't find it, but hallelujah. <laughs> 500 years and they were mad about that and then that makes sense though because they like you let man live to be 900 while our kids came and y'all like i ain't letting your kids do nothing but go ahead lauren i see you put some scriptures in the text oh you know i was coming i'm, I'm all excited now all right so then it said let me go back to verse one it said and they lifted me up into one place what's amazing about that you know when we see the past prophets ezekiel jeremiah isaiah they, they always say how the father lifted me up on my feet. He took me to this place. And you can see the same thing that you see later on, where they are witnessing in their prophecies and in their parables about what they see. And you see it almost like um, scattered within all the prophets. And what I love about chapter 17, in this particular chapter, you can link it to all the prophets. Every one of them almost. Because every one of them talked about the light, the thunder. Um, even when a prophet says his, he directed it under the whole heaven, his lightning into the ends of the earth. That's Job. And also Job said when he make a decree for the rain and a way for the lightning of the thunder. And he sent out his arrows and scattered them, lightning and discomfited, discomfited them. That's Second Samuel. So whenever they speak, in, it's funny because Enoch definitely sees it. He sees exactly what they're speaking of. And you could tell they bore the same Ruach because that Ruach was straight from the Shemaim that was ministering to all the prophets at once. And in Ezekiel chapter one, verse 13, he said, and for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire. And like the appearance of lambs, it went up and down among the living creatures and the fire was bright. And out of the fire went forth lightning. Ezekiel verse 14 said, the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning so fast. And then even then now, but now let's drop it down to Daniel 10 verse six. His body also was like a burl and his face as the appearance of lightning and his eyes as lamps of fire and his arms and his feet like in the color of polished brass. And the voice of his words was like the voice of multitude. And it's amazing because he goes in, even in Zechariah, you can keep going. Well, all the prophets is basically visualizing the Shemaim, visualizing the people they're seeing. And it all matches definitely in the book of Enoch to that chapter. And I just want to pull one more verse and I'm going to leave. I promise. I'm not going to go all the way through because it's all the way through. When you just pull up lightning in the, in the Torah and you just look when he says, um, when they sit there seeing or they're hearing the lightning and the father's in charge of these things, um, even when he speaks about the gates, the gates of when things go in and when things go out, that is spoke of by Ezekiel. So in Zechariah 9, 14, it says, and Yahuwah shall be seen over them and his arrows shall go forth as the lightning and Yahuwah Elohim shall blow the trumpet and shall go with whirlwinds of the south. So when we see the father really is releasing or really releasing the wrath upon the earth. These, to me personally, I think these are the chambers that Enoch is saying that it will come out of as well. Hallelujah, and you are right. All of the prophets do speak about lightning and being lifted up to high places. Well, I don't say all, but most of them and the different visions and dreams and things that they would have. Um, you get that same premise in, in the extra books, uh, Second Ezra, um, uh, 
there's so many I didn't go blank, but um, it that makes sense because we know, um, and I go to this a lot. The Book of Jude, he says, he tells us that Jude fourteen. Verse 14, and Enoch also the seven from Adam prophesied of the same. Behold, Yahuwah cometh with 10,000 of his saints. Or the master really is talking about Yahushua, but Enoch prophesied. So, and we know a prophecy is the planting of the seed or the opening up of some knowledge through the Ruach from Yah. So there's no difference between the prophets or Enoch in um, even in the terminology as you see see that these visions, these understandings, these things that's happening, they always have to come from Abba Yah. So hallelujah. Um, Mir, I seen you. Don't run. We got you here now. You're gonna learn the secret handshake. I know, I know I'm trying to give it up. <laughs> um, I have a question. Well, I had a question, but so, in 176, um, my Enoch reads a little bit different, but it says that they came to this great river and that is a place where no flesh can walk. On yours, it says where no all flesh must walk cautiously, but then you said this might be Sheol. So my question is, is it safe to assume, well, we know that once we die, we lose this body, right? The body returns to the, the dirt, and the soul goes to the holding place or whatever. But I'm assuming that in that spirit realm, people can still recognize each other, even without a body. True. And the reason I came to this conclusion is because of the rich man and, and Lazarus. He was like, hey, send Lazarus over here. You know what I'm saying? So he clearly recognized Lazarus. And you know, Yeshua was like, that's not happening. But so it's just like reading Enoch, it just opens more questions than answers really, because it's kind of like, we've never been to that realm. So it's kind of hard to imagine how do you recognize someone who doesn't have a body, you know, cause that's how we recognize each other on this earth plane. But I'm guessing that place is just like a different situation. I don't know really how to explain, how to explain it, so. That was just a thought that popped into my head that you can recognize each other without actually having a body. Hallelujah, I agree. And it, it gives more credence to, like when we read about the crucifixion of the Messiah, how they said that the, the earth was rent and the bodies of the earth were, uh, many who slept were risen. And we see that premise where the Ruach will go back into the body or even where Yahushua raised Lazarus, his body was in the tomb. And... Yahushua called his Ruach back to him, you know? So that makes sense the same way you can't walk in the heavens, in the heaven, in an in the earthly body. You can't walk in Sheol in the earthly body either. And it also gives credence to, on both sides, the heavens and the, and the bottom, um, it also gives credence to, you know, with man and today with their sciences, they're trying to get to the bottom of the ocean and the center of the earth, they'll say, and you can't. Just like they're trying to, they say they've been to the moon. I was just reading an article. They said they sent some satellite to the sun. And I think we're going to get to that in this book. The sun, it says, is it like the fourth, fifth level of heaven. So how could that satellite get to the sun? You know what I mean? You can't. Um, it's both ways. Man, flesh, and he just said that about the fall, about the giants, though. He said, flesh is to be on the earth and in the earth. Flesh, the Ruach, we always have to remember, is Yah's. It goes to a place where flesh can't go. I mean, flesh is Yah's, too, but the Ruach has to come back to him. Um, yeah, and it reminded me of um, a lesson you did. I don't remember the extra book that you used when it talked about um, Hamashiach and when he went into Sheol to you know, um, minister to the ones that were, that are there or were there and they wouldn't have had bodies like David and, and, you know, all their ancestors that had died before, but they recognized each other because they were talking to each other. You know what I'm saying? So it's just something that I don't think we'll understand in this, but I, I what just popped into my mind is kind of like when you're sleeping, 
or when you're dreaming, it's like you're in the dream realm. Your body, your physical body is in your bed, but you can recognize people, but they're not there. You see what I'm saying? Like you see them like having a body, you can recognize your mom, your kids, whomever, but those people aren't literally there. Their bodies are where their bodies are. So I'm thinking maybe that's how it is in the spirit realm where your spirit is there, but your body is somewhere else. That just popped into my head as I was talking. No, hallelujah. I agree. I agree. I, and, and in that reading, we were talking about the three days and three nights in the in on or in Sheol or what, for lack of a better word, that Yahushua upon death would do. And when he went there, it was Adam and all those people. And Adam knew Seth and Shawa. You know, everybody were born in different generations. So everybody might not have knew everybody. Right. True indeed, Aki. Um, but the people who were born in the generations around who knew each other, yes. Um, now I can't explain how that is. That's another one of those things. But somehow, um, you could recognize people recognize each other in 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 the when there's just their ruach in these places. So um, I can't explain that, but I do agree with that thought. It's on you, Akiva. But uh, it's because our mind can't comprehend it. Right, I can't. So the the problem is, is when we think ruach, we think. Um, we think spirit and we think unseen. So I put in in the in the chat. Um, I believe this was Second Corinthians. Um, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, that's speaking of your body. We have a building of Elohim and house not made with hands, eternal in the Shamayim. So there's that's that's the heavenly body or your ruachal body. Right, so it's it's difficult, um, but there is there is something um, that she said invisibility. There is something that will house your ruach in Shamayim. Um, there is something. So, and it, I don't want, I don't want to go too far with this, but if you're forever being tormented, but you have no body, then how are you? Be what's what's the feeling of pain coming from? Something what like you said that we can't comprehend. Right, there has to be something that houses um, your your ruach, um, and I and I think you know like you you can look into this, you know you can take this as far as you want, right? You know Yahusha said in my father's house are many mansions. If it was not so, you know, I would have told you, right. right? I, you know, I'm going to prepare this, this house for you. So, I mean, you know, that can also be, you know, thought of as, as a, as a body, but our mind has a problem comprehension, um, Ruako as something that can be physical or tangible. Hallelujah. And you know, to your point, that scripture you put, it says, <laughs> just to make a point for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved we have a building of elohim so that's showing you just like when yahushua said what does it profit a man to gain the world and lose his soul what he's trying to say is i was there at the creation of the earth and i was there at the creation of your soul your soul is worth more than the entire earth this earthly house is one thing but your Ruach is housed in a building, something much greater than this. Um, and you're right. I think it's just beyond comprehension. That's why we can't completely comprehend. Although I do believe, I mean, I shouldn't say I believe, but I do agree with some of the statements that's been made tonight about the separating of the Ruach and the body and going to these different places and even the torment of the soul. But I can't comprehend exactly what that would look like. Real quick before Lauren goes, and I'm, I'm not going to uh, beleaguer this point, but you and I spoke about this before, about the lake of fire, right? And I believe that the lake of fire is something that can destroy Ruachs, right? right. I believe that it was made for the Malachim. Um, I lost my point, but... That's true. But, but I, 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 I lost the I'll point, make a point, point I was trying to... You understand that gold is tried in fire. It's cleaned. Abi say he's going to try us in fire, our Ruachs. The lake of fire has to be the hottest fire ever created. 
if it's destroying Ruach, because the Ruach can be cleansed and tried in fire. So if the lake of fire is destroying Ruachs, that means that has to be a heat, once again, that's beyond comprehension. Right. I think the point I was going to make is that your Ruach is not completely destroyed, right? If he's there at the making of your Ruach, it's not completely destroyed um, until the lake of fire. Um, so it's, it's, it's being housed by something, um, I think was the point I was trying to make. But anyway, you get it. <laughs> yeah, it's on you, Lauren. Oh, no, I just wanted to point out, um, well, to be honest, I, I don't know how to say this in so many words. I mean, I always believe that your spirit is, you know, I believe that there is, of course, there's an afterlife. <sighs> That's what they call it, afterlife. And it's funny in a way because it's it's like okay the father says you know you have to do good in this world in order you in order for you to receive eternal life eternal life is living in your spirit without your body and you know that part so I'm like okay if the body die and I and I have my spirit and my spirit is righteous it shall live but the spirits that are wicked um you know I've always you know been under the belief that they wait they wait till they go to the day of judgment. And I've always had that belief because of Luke chapter 16, because it says in Luke, you know, when he talked about um, the beggar in Luke chapter 16, verse 21, he said, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs, which fell from the rich man's table, moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels, the angels, to the, into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lift up his eyes. So he saw something. You can see. Because he lift up his eyes and he's being in torment. And seeth Abraham from afar off. And Lazarus in his bosom. So it has to be a figure of him. In order for him to know that's Abraham. And know that that's the same beggar that, that was just begging you. God. You have to see that. So when so you see them, you're like, okay, so he noticed them. So you can see that even in hell, they can look up. He lift up his eyes. And it's funny, he says that. But it says, let's keep going. In verse 24, he said, he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. And it reminded me of the demons and the spirits, how they have no food and no water. It's almost like we're thrown down there with them. It's almost like he becomes an evil rock. He's wicked. So then it keeps going. It says in verse 20 and 25, but Abraham says, son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receive of thy good things and likewise Lazarus, evil things. But now he is com comforted and thou art tormented. And I always thought about like tormented. Like, what does that look like? And like, I even tried to study what it means when the father says the worm. When he spoke of the worm, how it will burn down and their worm won't die. And even when I looked in the Hebrew, I could not find what does that mean? I've been trying to figure that out for years. Like, what did he mean by their worm will not die? And I wanted a little clarification and I wanted to ask about that. Did anybody, you know, go find their studies in Isaiah 66, verse 24, when he said that they shall go forth and look upon the dead carcasses of men that have transgressed transgress against Yahuwah, for their worms shall not die. Neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be abhorring unto the flesh. Um, Mira, to your point, I don't think this tongue is like figuratively a physical tongue, like we're talking. I think it's, he's talking about his language, his speech. Um, I don't believe it's just talking about like a tongue because if he's in the spiritual body, I don't believe he has a physical tongue. Like we have a tongue for arranging food in our mouth for, you know what I mean? I think this is a tongue. He's more so talking about his speech or his language or something along those lines. Um, Oxam, I know you read the Apocalypse of Shaul and if I'm not mistaken, I'll be y'all Shaul to see a righteous person die and a wicked person die. And in both cases, it was angels that would come to get the dead. Am I, is that correct? I can't remember exactly. Um, yes, yes, you're, you're right. Uh, the, um, 
if and if you don't mind if i can just say a few things and with regards to that point um in the apocalypse of paul both with the righteous person and the unrighteous who went to their destinations it described and specifically for the righteous person it described a separation of their um spirit man and their soul conscious and their actual um you know and the father condemning what they did in the flesh as well and so um yes to your to your question that there was that type of separation but i was going to say in the chat um in the same way in dreams how we can perceive things and see and touch and also consume um food and drink things and which we know to be uh, dreams take place in the spiritual realm um it's something like that and like you said you know we'll never be able to fully comprehend but i believe it's it also ties into um the study of how our body will somehow merge with our spirit at the resurrection um but you know alongside what you said Akdre, about you know the tongue with the rich man um that's what i kind of likened it to in terms of it being similar to how we can see and perceive and uh, perceive the five senses in the spiritual realm um and it, it is difficult to to put into legit words but i believe it's somewhere along those lines hallelujah um can I add something right quick, please? So I agree with you that, you know, a lot of times when the scripture talks about tongue is referring to um, like languages and stuff, but I feel like in this case, it's an actual tongue, not like the way we know it because we're talking about spiritual bodies and, you know, we're still trying to figure out what that would look like. But in the context of the story, he wanted Lazarus to come that he may dip the tip of his finger into water so he could cool his tongue because of the anguish of the flames so we see things that are it's not if it was just that one um attribute that he used like tongue then we could say okay he's talking about languages but here he's talking about fingers he's talking about the tip of the finger he's talking about just wanting a little bit of relief so it just doesn't line up in this context that he would be talking about languages but I do agree with what everybody is saying that it, you know, the spiritual body is possible what they have once they transition to the other side. Hallelujah. I, I only said that about the tongue because when you bring up the definition for that tongue, it says not naturally acquired, just to show that it's different than what we consider a tongue. Now, as far as how exactly, um, you know, like the ox said, we are to perceive things. So that's the best way to explain it is, is it like your tongue, but I don't believe it's like our physical tongue is what I'll say, but only because the definition says it's not naturally um, acquired. And to the ox point about the angels coming to get you when you die, there is an angel, it also says, I believe it's that book. It may be like the apocalypse of Abraham as well. It says that every man has an angel with him in his conscience, like he said, every day. And when we die, they are the ones who bear witness. The angel that's with us, he says this, and then our conscience is the one who's like, nah, he really did this, this, and that. It bears the witness. Um, and that's why it says that the angels lifted this person up. He was carried by angels into Abraham's bosom at death. That happens to us all, it's, at least in some of the other extra books and, and multiple of them, it speaks of that. Um, and in one of count, two accounts I've seen in extra biblical books was Miriam's husband, Yosef, who was playing the role of Yahushua's physical father on the earth, and Abraham's death, Yah spoke about sending the most glorious angels to go get them, to comfort them as they transitioned, and um, just to give a, a like a precept to angels escorting you into this place where in the Enoch, as we're discussing, no flesh, no flesh can walk, you know? And in their cases, those angels were escorting them to paradise to wait because that's what Yahushua did. When he died, every man waited to wait, went to Sheol to wait. When Yahushua died and got the keys back from death and he got the victory, 
the separation came. Now, if you were a righteous man and you die, you go wait in paradise where it's light. If you were wicked, you go wait in Sheol and maybe even tormented where it's dark. And the time of Lazarus and them and all of them before Yahushua died, everybody wanted to wait in the Sheol. And based off how you lived your life determined if you were tormented or not when you waited. As that one says, he was tormented in whatever the finger is in the water for his tongue. Hallelujah. It's on you, Akiva. Toda, hop back to the Luke 16 for a second. I'm going to try to bring this. I'm going to try to make this make sense. All right. So what we have to understand is, and this, it, this is a difficult concept, but I'm going to try to make it as plain as possible. The body is just a house. The Ruach is what controls everything. So in, this, in Luke 16, 24, where he says, and he cried and said, Abba, Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I'm tormented in this flame. Now, we have to remember that, that this, this place he's at, Abraham's bosom, it's a, it's a, it's a Kodesh place, a place that was, was crafted and created by the Most High. The body is not Kodesh. It can't be there. So why do we see this language of um, cool my tongue? Um, I'm being tormented, even though common sense tells us that he has no body. It's because those thoughts of the cooling of his tongue and being tormented are hard-coded in his Ruach. So here's a, here's a, here's a, a, a an even simpler way to do it. We got to stop thinking of things like you do something, right? And someone comes to, they look at your computer and they say, hey, you know, your computer is beat up and it's ugly. The computer or, or, or the computer that you see is not the information. The hard drive that's inside of it is the information. So our bodies are, are, they're that computer housing, but all of the information, all of the feelings, even the brain function, all of that stuff is hard-coded in the hard drive. So the reason the language is like this is because it's being told to, to you know, who people who, who think fleshly, we, we, think, we think flesh first and then Ruach second. Um, the most high thinks, you know, the most high operates on Ruach first, flesh is, is secondary when you appear before him you don't necessarily have to appear in the flesh you may it's it's so deep that you may think you're in the flesh and the most high is only seeing your ruach if you can understand that concept then all of this will all of this will make sense um hopefully that made sense but toda aki yeah. and some ox sam said too it's like a dream you know when we're in the dream I had a dream recently where I've never been to Egypt in real life, yet I had a dream just talking about how you perceive things in a dream state, which is, which is like a Ruwaku state. I had a dream where I was standing amongst a military and it was rank and file. It was just as far as I could see, it was military standing in line. And in the dream, I'm saying to myself, how did I get to Egypt? I didn't see the pyramids or nothing in the dream, yet I could perceive that for some reason I was in Egypt looking at this army preparing for war. Um, and that's just a part of the dream. It was a wild dream actually, but the rule, like in the Ruwakul state, you perceive things, right? Um, in a way, and in our mind, in our flesh, we have to reconcile that perception in a way, you know what I'm saying? So the way in our mind is like, okay, this is happening. And we can't explain it in a Ruach way because we don't know the true power of the Ruach. We haven't been to the Shemaim. The, right. the fallen angels can see it and be like, no, that's such and such and such and such, which is why Abiyah is saying they're out of order, right? But we have to explain it in the only way we know how. And the only way we know how is in an earthly way. Right. It's And it's, it's literally like the matrix, right? Like we may be, you know, I can see my hand and see my arm and I can live this life. But truly, 
Um, and honestly, I'm already at the judgment. Akpaka Yahoo and had the, and I had this conversation before. I believe that. Um, so, I've had my mother passed away, my father passed away. Um, I've had several, you know, family members pass away. Um, I believe that when you pass away, because it's a sleep, right? When you pass away, you are here one minute, right? And the next minute you're immediately at the judgment. Problems. So when I pass away, and when I pass away, I go to the judgment and all of you are already there as well. That's that's the way, that's the way I see it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, we gotta move on. Enough about Shio, man. Y'all, you know, I don't know what it is about this Enoch reading, man. Y'all be turned up about Shio in the lake of fire and all that. Y'all gotta calm down with that, man. It's an interesting read. That's always my, no, come on. <laughs> I don't be wanting to think that much about the Lake of Fire and Sheol. I'm trying to duck it. I never want to see none of that. <laughs> For real, but hallelujah. Verse 8, I mean, chapter 18. Remember, Enoch is still detailing what he's seeing as he's, they're taking him from this high mountain. So I believe he's close to the firmament somehow. And he's going down into the depths of the earth or under the earth, however you want to put that. Chapter 18, and I saw the storerooms of all the winds. As we go forward, remember winds and ruach or spirit is the same hebraically. The ruach is like a wind, right? Abi Yab blew the ruach into man, and in a sense, it was like he blew breath into his He blew a wind into him. And I saw how with them he was embroidered, embroidered all creation as well as the foundations of the earth. He's talking about wind. He's embroidered all creation as well as the foundations of the earth are embroidered in a wind or a ruach. And you'll get why I'm saying that. I, I read this yesterday, actually. I saw the cornerstone of the earth. I saw the four winds which bear the earth as well as the firmament of heaven. So I'm going to say this. We may read this one day in here if we ever make it through this. Because at this rate, 105 chapters, we're going to be in this. We'll be in this next year at this time. But with that, I saw the four winds which bear the earth as well as the firmament of heaven. I don't believe those were winds. I believe these were spirits. These were angels. And I say that because when you read the third book of Enoch, when he has been translated and he's in the heavens detailing the angels, he talks about these pillars of the earth being really powerful angels that hold the earth up. So I preface that on that. Um, I'm not going to bring that up. We may read through that one day, but I don't want you to, I don't see this as just like the wind is holding up the earth. No, he's talking about four really powerful Ruachs that's holding up the earth and the firmament. And he details this in his later books. I saw how the winds ride the heights of heaven and stand between heaven and earth. These are the very pillars of heaven. And in that book, he details these, these angels, which are really powerful. And he talks about how like all of the other angels in heaven are scared of them. And although they don't do nothing but stand there and hold up these things, he will talk about how all of these other angels, all everything else in the Shemaim were scared of these certain angels, except for like Yahushua, the Ruach, and Abiyah. But like all of the rest of the angels would fear and tremble at these certain angels because of what they were doing. They, and they were big. He would describe them as bigger than every other angel. Like it's weird. The third book of Enoch is weird. I had to read it twice. The first time I read it, I had to put it down because I'm like, this is way beyond my pay grade. And then as I got better with the scriptures and I read it again, I slightly understood some of it more. I, I can't say I completely understood it. But these are the very pillars of heaven. I saw the winds which turn the heaven and cause the star to set. There's angels over uh, mapping the stars and there's angels over um, the stars being in order. There's angels over everything. Abiyah sits on the throne and he has these angels that he's telling to handle everything. So there's an angel over literal wind. 
There's an angel over the storehouse of lightning. There's an angel over the storehouse of snow. And then Abiyah says, send a blizzard through Chicago. And that angel opened that door and he let out as much snow as Abiyah said, and then he closed it back. So you get this picture better as you get to the third Enoch. I'm just breaking this down. So, um, you know, just as an example of some of the things that he explained, um, any comments and all that I'm open to because I'm not standing on that. I'm just I'm just showing that Enoch goes deeper into this at another time later. Um, the sun as well as all the stars. There's an angel over the course of the sun, right? I saw the souls carried by the clouds. I saw the path of the angels and the ultimate end of the earth and the firmament of heaven above. He's on this mountain again, I'm assuming, looking into this remember he isn't in heaven this is telling us he has not went to the shemaim yet he's detailing this now and i kept moving in the direction of the west and it was flaming day and night toward the seven mountains of precious stones three toward the east and three toward the south as for those toward the east they were of colored stones one of pearl stone one of healing stone and as for those toward the south they were of red stone the ones in the middle were pressing into Shemaim, like the throne of Elohim. So as he's moving, he's seeing some really big mountains that he's saying these mountains, some of these mountains tops climb into the, to, to, to the heavens. And once again, whether man knows where these are at and governments is hiding that, I can't say. But what I will say is, if they do know, they ain't teaching this in no science class. This is this almost kind of falls along the line of like, is the earth flat or not? They're not teaching that, you know, which I don't even get what it benefits, man, to say that the earth is a globe or flat. Well, when I, now that I said that, I just thought a thought like it benefits them to say it's a globe. That way they don't have to teach all of this if they know it's there. But that's just a thought. The ones in the middle pressing into heaven like the throne of Elohim, which is of alabaster and whose summit is of sapphire. And we understand in Revelation when it talks about the throne room of Yah, sapphire is one of the colors that's present. And I saw a flaming fire and I saw what was inside those mountains, a place beyond the great earth. So inside of these mountains, he said, is a place beyond what we know as earth, right? Where the heavens come together. And I saw a deep pit. So he's at for sake of the flat earth believers, they talk about Antarctica as this ice sheet around the entire planet, right? Where he's at is he's where heaven and earth meet. And he's not going up though. As you see, he said, I saw a great pit. He's looking down into Sheol with heavenly fire on its pillars, right? True, Aki. With heavenly fire on its pillars. I saw inside them descending pillars of fire. Now, once again, there are, be, we look at Sheol and it's the place of Hasatan and the spirits and that's true. But as we go through other things and we you never know where we'll go next, but Abiyah has angels that he has also put over Sheol, right? It isn't just, Sheol isn't just a lawless place. Sheol, even though it's under the earth, it is under Abiyah's control. Even before Yahushua went there and got the victory, it was still ran in an order that Abiyah said was okay for it to be ran. Abiyah runs all. So with heavenly fire on his pillars, these is possibly angels as well that he's seeing as he's looking down into the earth. And these are probably the ones that Abiyah has set over the function of Sheol. Now how Hasatanim is tormenting people there who are wicked, that's different, but there are angels over the function of what we call Sheol. I saw inside them descending pillars of fire that were immeasurable in respect to both altitude and depth, big angels if so, that he couldn't even understand. And on top of that pit, I saw a place without the heavenly firmament above it or earthly foundation under it or water. So he's seen something that's just suspended, right? He's seeing something here that's just suspended in between heaven and earth. There was nothing on it, not even birds, but it was a desolate and terrible place. Man, see why I don't be wanting to think about Sheol? That sounds crazy. <laughs> you in there looking up and you can't, and, and you could see that you looking up, but there is no firmament up. Like that, that's just beyond me. And I saw there seven stars, which were like great burning mountains. Then the angel said to me, this place is the ultimate end of heaven and earth. This is where they meet. 
This is the end of earth and where it meets heaven because I don't think there is no end to the Shemaim, but it is the prison house for the stars. So this ain't even just Sheol. This is where those angels are going to go. And the powers of the Shemaim, right? And the stars which roll over up on the fire, they are the ones which have transgressed the commandments of Abiyah from the beginning of their rising because they did not arrive punctually. Mm. Let that be a lesson to us. Arrive when y'all call you punctually. Jonah, remember Jonah didn't arrive punctually. He had to go through a, 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 something else that's beyond comprehension. Did Jonah really get swallowed by a whale? And if so, how big was the whale? And he was in the belly of it for three days and didn't spit him out on the coast of Nineveh because he didn't arrive punctually. Just something to make you think. And he was wroth with them and bound them unto the time of the completion of their sin in the year of mystery. And I assume that mystery is the when the mystery of iniquity comes to its fruition or whatever and all things are answered. But um, Enoch said he's looking into these seven mountains and it's a dark pit, endless, Angels is over it, these fiery pillars, and we know now it's the prison house of the stars. So Abiyah has his angels watching them, um, which is just beyond comprehension in general. But it's, it's, that's just kind of like a brief overview of what I kind of felt like I could understand. I, I, I'm not the end all be all on this, but any questions or comments on chapter 18? It's on you, Akiva. Uh, so um, this is the, this seems this appears to be describing a lake of fire, right? Um, Eleven, and I saw a deep pit. That's speaking of that cauldron. Remember the cauldron we were talking about, right? With heavenly fire or fire from the Shamaim. You know when um, when we came out of Mitzrayim and the, the fire was first put on the altar, um, it is said that the Most High was the one who provided that fire for the altar. Um, if you think about that and you think about um, Aharon's two sons offering a strange fire, you know, you, you could kind of, you could kind of see why, um, but I also want to speak to your, um, your breakdown of the four winds um, and it possibly being four Ruachs. It's, that is, um, you're probably right. Um, Revelation speaks of the Caribbean, um, the four Caribbean, um around the throne. I believe Ezekiel 1 speaks about those Caribbean, um being under the throne, carrying the throne, um, and also carrying the foundation of the earth, right? And, you know, these Caribbean, right, and above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne, right? Um, these Caribbean, they are described having um, um, different faces, four different faces. This is something Akbakad Yahu and I learned um, prior to or in the process of being woken up. Those four faces, I think it's the, the face of a man, the face of a lion, the face of an ox, and I forget what the last face was, um, but it's four faces. Um, there you go, face of a lion, face of a man, face of a lion, face of an ox, face of an eagle. When, and maybe if, if he's available to talk, he can chime in. I can't remember if it's Leviticus or Numbers where um, the Hebrews were, the Most High was, was separating the Hebrews by camps, um, separating our people by camps. And the camps were separated by threes. And each one of those camps had a leader tribe, right? So Yehuda was the leader of one. Um, I believe um, Ephraim was the leader of another. Each one of those leaders had a signet. And those signets were each one of these things that we see on the face of the Caribbean, a lion, um, an ox, a man, and an eagle. And when you look down on it, the way it's described is the same way it's described as the Caribbean um, holding up the, the throne of Yah that we see here in Ezekiel 1.10. Um, so I just say all of that to say that your assessment um, is, is probably correct. It's probably more than likely um, Caribbean, 
um, that you're that that we're that's being spoken of that's actually holding the earth and and holding the pillars of, of Shalayim. So, Torah. Aki, the thought of that, <laughs> you know, the deeper we get into this, the, the, the things that I'll be, I'll let us understand, like, um, you know, just take ourselves outside of who we are now, who we used to be, who the world is, oblivious to these things, like scientists, like people in the world are trying to prove y'all wrong. And, you know, um, we have an answer for everything, you know, yet when you read things like this, it's like, what we are living on are being is being held by beings. Like the thought of that, like if that doesn't make you feel small, <laughs> like to me when I when I think of that as a human being, that makes me feel so small. You know, they try to do that with science. The universe is big and it's life here and there. That's what they do to try to make you feel small. But when I read, that doesn't make me feel small. But when I read things like this and it's like, you know, y'all could get mad and just say, you know what, uh, pillar number three, shake the earth, man, on that side. You know, like it just makes it just makes the human experience. It just makes me feel small. Like this is why we have to humble ourselves before y'all. Like we don't really. And, and he tells us that, though, at your greatest, you are small, you know, but at your smallest, you are at your greatest. Right. So he's telling he's really letting us know all through scripture. You really are small in this creation, but my love for you makes you the greatest. It's on you, uh, Lauren. I don't know. I, I was listening. You didn't mess me up. My bad. Um, I, I was, yeah, told off for that, Kepa. That, that was cool, though, because he brought it back to numbers when it come down to the camps. And he talked about the, you know, when, when you see that we were scattered to the four winds of the earth. And then you see the angel standing at the four winds of the earth and the father said he will gather us from the four sectors of the earth. Um, and then you see like in Matthew, I think it's 24 verse 31, when he said, uh, he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds and from one in the heaven to the other. And I thought, you know, that's, uh, you know, what I always thought about when I thought about the four angels that sit on each pillar. And I also think of us being scattered along each pillar and how at the end, it's almost like they just grab and shelter, so shelter, shelter us and push us directly to the father or moves us. And um, there is another verse as well. I think it's like Zechariah chapter two, verse six, when he says, um, um, come forth and flee from the land of the north, says Yah, for I have spread you abroad as the four winds of heaven, says Yahuwah. And when you said about the wind being the rock, I thought about that. So, wow, you know, so when we think about how we worry and everything else, always think about the Father always looking down upon us, literally leaning down, looking at you on each corner of the earth. Mm. It's not one place you are at where he did not see you at all times. And I also thought about uh, Daniel chapter 11, verse four, when he said, and when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven and not to his prosperity, nor according to his dominion, which he ruleth for his kingdom shall be plucked up, even of others beside those. And the king of the south, sh south shall be strong and one of his princes, and he shall be strong above him and have dominion. His dominion shall be great dominion. Um, he's speaking of the end. And even, you know, when he speaks about the four winds, how those angels, they have power to definitely do what the father told them to do. So they're going to crush the earth, but they are going to, you know, I think take part in to gather in Israel during the end days. Hallelujah. I don't have any comments about the rest of this. Like I say, you know, this was good. We building in this together because a lot of this is beyond me. Um, I know I DJ you um, Ezekiel chapter one had been on your mind. I know I hope some of what we discussed kind of helps play into what you were trying, what you were seeking for in that. Um, Cause this, like, you got something you want to add? You on mute if you were, if you're talking. 
If not, we gonna move on. All right. Yeah, no, nah, my bad. I we had the kids in the background. I was all good. But no, nah, no, nah, this this does help out a lot to 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 what I was looking at. So, and maybe you could go back through this and maybe read it alongside the Ezekiel and see what you come up with. Yeah, that's what I was thinking about as y'all was going through it and I was listening and see you match up some things. After eighteen, just so you know. Okay, word. Right. Hallelujah. So moving on, we're going to read a, these a couple short chapters. 19. And Uriel, which we brought him up last, uh, one of our previous ones, I think he was the one over that cauldron, if I'm not mistaken, um, Akifa, which makes sense. He would be the one showing him this. He's the angel. Yah has set over that cauldron, that deep pit where he's locking these angels. And Uriel said to me, here shall stand in many different appearances the Ruachs of the angels which have united themselves with women. They have defiled the people and will lead them into error so that they will offer sacrifices to the demons as unto the gods until the great day of judgment in which they shall be judged till they are finished. Now look, Uriel is prophesying himself here because that's what we got today. When people, prime example, Christmas is, is this Shabbat. Sun worship, Nimrod, Ashtaroth and Astarte and Tammuz birthday. And you know, all of these things that trace back to evil demonic doctrines is a prime example of him saying they will, all, people about to offer sacrifices <laughs> to the people of those days, the light of Elohim, okay? People about to offer sacrifices to those days and um, the demonic origins or evil origins, you know, non-Yah origins of those days. And he said that these Ruachs, they have defiled people and will lead them into error so that they will offer sacrifices to the demons as unto gods, unto the great day of judgment in which they shall be judged till they are finished. Until the great day of judgment, once again, Abiyah is going to let this flourish into the end. And see why... This statement like that just made me understand why the book of Enoch would have been so important, especially fresh out the flood. He was letting them know already, look, y'all better be ready. You finna have to deal with, see in my day, we just had to deal with the fallen angels tricking the seed of Cain and anybody else who would listen. In your day, you got the fallen angels still around. You got the demons still around. I mean, you got the demons now gonna come around. You gonna have to fight. You gonna have to battle to the end, he's saying, until all this is finished, you gonna have to fight. And their women, whom the angels have led astray, will be peaceful ones. So I, Hanak, I saw the vision of the end of everything alone. And none among human beings will see as I have seen. That's a powerful statement. That's a powerful statement. I think in 20, it's just going to name the angels. Um, before I go, you want to speak to that, Oxam, about the women real quick? I'm sure that what I had said in the chat, I'll just repeat it. Um, I said, where it says the women who have been led astray will become peaceful ones. Um, it should say where it says uh, in the footnotes there that it also says sirens and other um, translations. And, you know, that's what I had kind of wanted to allude to the last time I spoke about, I believe, two weeks ago now um, in regards to like Bigfoot the Loch Ness, Loch Ness monster, you know, other seemingly mythological creatures that uh, humanity has glorified and worshiped throughout the ages. We know that they came from these types of origins. And um, the, the whole deal about, you know, sirens and um, mermaids, that topic in and of itself is, is related to the marine kingdom and those types of demonic entities that afflict men and I believe that's also mentioned in the Testament of Solomon as well. Um, the, the nature of the, those women who became sirens. Um, I'm, I'm not too sure why it says peaceful ones, um, because I believe in if this is not the Ethiopic version, either the Greek or uh, whichever other one, they most of them say sirens, like with the R.H. Charles translation. Um, 
And so I, I, I'm not too sure why it was re-transliterated as peaceful ones, but um, just wanted to point that out there. And I had mentioned that Starbucks, that being on the front, the logo is what we know to be a mermaid or siren, because you see the tail and that being is a worship in different parts of the world. And we know that that's a demonic entity. So I thought that was interesting. True. Um, and strangely, when you speak about sirens, because that is what it says. I don't know why they would translate that there like that, but you are right. They are mermaids. And you think you got the little mermaid and all of these cuddly cute movies that they pass on the kids, right? But in the even in the mythology of a mermaid, the mermaid was something wicked, even in the mythology. It was like these beautiful women, fish who would lure sailors into sea into the water and right. Die, right. But they teach our children like, like, you know, these are cool things, you know. We dress up as mermaids for Halloween and you know, that's fresh. That's not fresh. And I agree with you. That's where they come from. So we just got an answer to something. And the women who had the angels and the women who lay with the angels and were led astray, they became these mermaids and these sirens and all of that. So you just put another face um, to something. Hallelujah. 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 Toda. So I'm going to finish with chapter 20 because it just names the angels or the archangels, the angels that possibly, because these are spoken of in the third Enoch as well. It's a lot of angels close to Yah, but these are some of the ones that he keeps the closest to him. And as you read this, I want to say it's seven of them. Um, sometimes when I read this, I feel like these may be the seven angels in Revelation that blow the trumpets, but that's just a thought I've had. I have to study that further, but I'll read their names real quick. Chapter 20. Um, I do, Akoti. I believe that these seven angels are the ones who blow the trumpets in the revelation um but i could be wrong um i've did a lightweight study on it before but not nothing i could be standing on hallelujah true indeed chapter 20 verse 1 and these are the names of the kodesh malachim who watch who watch what who watch the earth from yah who watch men who watch the the goings on on the earth. And some of these were mentioned earlier when it said that men were praying in the time of the giants and it got to these three angels. It was Mike, I, El, I think Raguel was one and it was Raphael or I don't know, but it was three of them. Shuriel, one of the holy angels for he is of eternity and of trembling. I'm gonna let you speak to these names when I finish Akifa. Shuriel, one of the Kodesh Melachim, for he is of eternity and of trembling. Raphael, one of the holy angels, one of the Kodesh Melachim, for he is of the spirits of man. Raguel, one of the holy angels who take vengeance for the world and for the luminaries. Michael, one of the Kodesh Melachim, for he is obedient in his benevolence over the people and the nations. So Raphael, one of the Kodesh Melachim, who are set over the spirits of mankind who sin in the spirit. That's different. We sin in the flesh, but it says the spirits of mankind who sin in the spirit. That's deep. Gabriel, one of the holy angels who oversee the garden of Eden and the serpents and the Herabim. And you know what? I think that was six. But when it spoke about them, yeah, two, three, four, five, six, but it was one night, I don't want to go up there and get to trying to fish for it. But when we talked about the cauldron and all of that, it was one other angel and you all likened him to the one who holds the gate of Yah at the firmament and you likened him to Idris Elba's character on the movie Thor, how he could see everything and to get into what they were calling, um, I don't even remember what they were calling that realm, but you had to go through him. He controlled the gates through what they were calling the universe. But this angel, as we read earlier, he controlled the gates of the Shemaim and we know his levels to the Shemaim. I believe he would be the seventh. And I do believe that these angels are the ones blowing the trumpets and revelations. But uh, do you want to speak to the names, Akifa? I see you have put some over here. 
Hold on. Yeah, I just always try to make sure I'm understanding um, their function, what their name means. Um, so Suru El means Prince of Elohim. Um, Raphael means um, healing of Elohim or Elohim heals. Raguel means um, friend of Elohim or, or Elohim's friend. I'm trying to make sure I got all of them. Mikael means um, who is like Elohim. And I think it's Sarah Quell. Is the other one? Yeah. That uh, Sirach, Sirachael means mercy um, of Elohim. And then, of course, uh, Gabriel means um, hero um, of Elohim or strong man of, of Elohim or Elohim strength. Hallelujah. Any questions or comments as we close out on chapter 20? Um, from anything that we discussed today from Yah judging the angels when Enoch prayed and when he starts to, they, the angels start to envision. Remember, he's in vision here. But as he's starting to journey and he's starting at the top of what we would call earth, right? He's at the top of a high mountain when he starts and he's descending downward. But he also describes what he can see upward at a time as well. You know, real, real quick before um, the coach Lauren goes, it's funny that um, Gabriel means strength of Elohim because um, Gabriel is always the one who brings the word of Elohim um, to man. So, you know, that word being the strength of Elohim. Interesting. You know, what was, uh, was very interesting too about you saying that he is Gabriel is the strength or hero of Elohim, I think you said. Um, he is the one who brings the word of Elohim man. And when you go to the New Testament, he is the one who came and told Miriam, you're going to have the son of Elohim. Right. Which is the word of Elohim. He even declared the coming of the word of Elohim literally, right, to man. So that, that makes a lot of sense what you just said. It's on you, Lauren. Okay. Now, I was uh, thinking about what you said about, you know, the ones in Revelation, um, the one mentioned, and I tied it to uh, Daniel, because when Daniel was talking about, he saw the watchers, and we see in verse, in chapter 20, in verse 20, he said, these are the names of the angels who watch. You're, you're one of the holy angels, and they give the names. So, in Daniel chapter 4, verse 13, he said, I saw the visions of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher, and and holy one came down from heaven. He cried aloud, said, thus hew down the tree, cut off the branches, shake off the leaves, scatter his fruit, lest the beast get away from under it and the fowls from his branches. Neither let us leave the stuff of his roots in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass and tend the grass of the field and let it be wet with the dew of heaven. Let, let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from man's and let a beast's heart be given unto him. Let seven times pass over him. And then we go down to verse 17. This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth to whomsoever he will and set it up over it the basis of men. And I thought about the watchers when he said, well, you know, one of the holy ones came down here, those who watch. And I was thinking also of um, when we see in the scriptures, when the angels show up and they speak to the children of Israel, um, they come at certain times and they do the father's, you know, will. And I always thought about like, okay, well, when we come down to the watchers and, and I, I've also, you know, read Testament of Solomon too. And that's how you also see them um, over evil spirits as well. And I, like the spirit of Saul, for instance, um, when the spirit of Yah had left Saul, spirit of wisdom, I do believe, or the spirit of Yah, it was an evil rock that was sunk directly to him. And then you see in the Testament of Solomon when you see the angel's name. And then you all of a sudden see right underneath each name how they are controlling these things. And then we learn here that Uriel, he was over clamor and terror. 
Raphael was one of the holy angels who is over the Ruach of men. Raguel was one of the holy angels to who inflicts punishment on the world and the luminaries. And then we see in the Testament of Solomon of that particular evil spirit saying, this is what I do. But then you see, well, who do you answer to? And then he says, I answer to Uriel. I answer to Raphael. I answer to Ragul. So I just wanted to point that out. That's all. Hallelujah. Um, does Daniel, um, does Daniel, I found this verse. I have read this before, but it stuck out to me once again when I read the third book of Enoch when he actually has been translated and he's detailing the angels and the Shemaim because he breaks down these watchers and these holy ones. Um, and it, it actually was a footnote that sent me to these verses and I went and looked at it like, okay. So those are two different, angels two different classes of angels in the Shemaim he had the watchers and he had the holy ones and they come down and what's interesting about these verses that you bring up here in Daniel is if I'm not mistaken and somebody could speak to this on the call they're coming down the tree they're ewing down is Nebuchadnezzar remember he did seven years in the wilderness as king he was given the heart of a beast and when he came back he was like yeah Daniel yo Elohim the one <laughs> and I believe it said he made decree throughout all his kingdom that the Elohim of the Israelites was the one. And that's another one of those things that make you wonder because you know, the people don't just destroy things of, um, the Persians definitely didn't destroy it because we know they took the city without a fight under his son, Belshazzar, I believe, or Belteshazzar, however you pronounce it. So that's one of the things is like, yeah, they probably got that decree in the Vatican Museum as well. Like, nah, we ain't let nobody see that he was saying that about Israel because it doesn't go with the narrative of Israel has been replaced with the church. See, you can understand certain things and why they hear certain things as I be at work with us. But I just found it ironic that he said, I saw in the vision of my head, he was asleep. And behold, Abba Yah showed him these angels come down and cut him down and give him a beast heart. And he was like that for seven years, seven times pass over, right? And it said, this is a matter of the decree of the watchers and the holy ones to the, to the intent that the living may know that the most high ruler in the kingdom of men, Abiyah was coming to let him know. Abiyah was coming to let Nebuchadnezzar know, like he showed him in his first dream, Daniel told him with the statue and the gold as the head, that's you. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's you, huh? you feel me? And Abiyah is coming to let him know, I've set you up. I, and this is a lesson for us today, because we're in America, which is new, we're in a, we're, we're in a new Babylonian, doc, under a new Babylonian captivity and doctrine is worldwide, literally now, right? And I've allowed you to gather and to take my people captive and to rule over them. And the same way I sent these watchers to you down you, to let you know that even though you got all this power, I've given it to you. In the end, I'm going to send Yahushua with 10,000 of his saints, and they're going to destroy every nation of this world where my people are at because I've allowed them. And as they get back right with me and I hear their cry, I'm going to come and answer it for them. Um, and I just feel like that's just a reason right there to say hallelujah. It's on you, Lauren. Okay, this is my last time, I promise. Okay, um, I just wanted to say, so it's funny because he talks about he's a tree. And he's saying that, you know, he's coming down and hewing him down. And then you see in 2 Baruch chapter 36, where he has a vision where it's a whole bunch of trees. Now he says he's one of the trees. And each tree is a people and what they worship. And then you see the true vine, which is John 15, which is Yahush, what it comes through there. And he talks about hewing the trees down, cutting them all down. And the true vine speaks and, um, and speaks directly and says, no, I'm the true vine. Everything else here has to go, basically. And it's in 2 Bar Baruch chapter 36. And the beginning, it talks about, you know, he's going into a vision um, in the night and he sees a forest and it's full of trees planted on a plain, lofty, rugged, ro rocky mountain surrounding it. And that the forest occupied much space. And against it, it rose a vine. And from under it, there went forth a fountain peacefully, the water. Now that the fountain came to the forest and was stirred into the great waves, 
and those waves submerged that forest and sub suddenly they rooted out the greater part of the forest and overthrew all of the mountains. Mm -hmm. And then it says, let me see here, I apologize. Um, it says, and now that the fountain came to the forest and was stirred into the great waves, let's go all the way down to verse five, and the height of the forest began to be made low and the top of the mountains was made low and the fountain prevailed greatly so that it left nothing of the great forest save one setter only. Also what it had cast it down and had destroyed the rooted out the greater mm -hmm. part of that forest so that nothing was left of it, nor could it place being recognized. And then the vine began to come with the fountain in peace, in great tranquility. And it came to, came to a place which was not far from the setter. And they brought the setter which had been cast down to it. And I behold and lo, the vine opened his mouth and spoke and said to the setter, are you not that setter which was left of the forest of wickedness? And by who means wickedness persisted and that was wrought all those years and goodness never. And um, I thought about when he said, well, this, this, he, he was one tree. And you see the father uprooting all these wicked things, all these wicked people. He uprooted Nimrod. He uprooted all these different kings. And I always thought about the forest that Baruch mentions. Is each tree and each faction of all these evil rocks that control people and they're worshiping demons and they're worshiping their gods. And the father coming and basically chopping down each one of the trees. Hallelujah. And I, you know, I brought up a definition for tree over here. I brought it up because to your point is ets or ots, a tree from its firmness, hence wood, carpenter, gallows, it tells you these different things. But in the, in the ancient, um, I don't know if my not by you, you're hawking up, but me and her was having a conversation along these lines. In the ancient, it tells you the upright and firmness of a tree. We know Hebrew words speak to the function of something. And in this word, it says the upright and firmness of the tree the elders of the tribe were upright and firm ones making decisions and giving advice. So I just bring that up to show that Hebraically, now there are multiple words for the word tree in the Bible. Let me state that. This ain't the only one. But I just brought this up to show that trees have been used to describe the upright, the elders, or even mighty men because a mighty, strong, powerful man is like the firmness of a tree branch, which we know is very strong. Like a tree branch is some of the, if you see a storm or something and it came through and it cracked trees in half, that would have to be a really powerful storm because trees are actually bend and not even break. So that's just, it speaks to, sometimes trees speaks to the firmness of a man, the power, I guess of a woman as well, the power or the, you know, the firmness, the, the strength of, a leader or a hero or a mighty man or an elder or whatnot. So that's just to your point about the trees. Hallelujah. Anything else before we close out? Been a good read, man. We moving along, man. We ain't getting as many verses in as I, I mean, chapters in as I want, but some of these are really short, so we'll continue to uh, move on. I keep, I was thinking tonight as we were reading, like when you'd be doing a Friday, sometimes it'd be quiet and you like, man, y'all ain't got nothing for me. Can you imagine doing this Enoch in there with 20, 30, 40 people? <laughs> yeah, nah. <laughs> nah. I mean, with Enoch, and I say that respectfully, I think the reason that be is because Genesis, really of all the books of the Bible, the language of it is so, is, I don't want to say plain, but understandable to where, it speak directly to points, you know what I mean? This Enoch is like, it's, it's just something that a lot of people worry about in general. Right, right. And that's why it helps to have a good understanding of the script um, as a whole before you even try to touch Enoch. A lot of times, you know, myself included, a lot of times, you know, when we first get into it, we're looking for the fantastical. Um, so we're dabbling in Enoch and Joshua and Jubilees trying to, you know, prove a point that, you know, we may think we see, uh, it, you know, it's that shiny object I speak about, uh, but it's not, you know, all of us on this call um, have a good firm understanding of Torah. Um, so it's edifying, but it's definitely not a book that I would recommend for 
um, someone who's not, you know, semi-versed or, you know, extremely well-versed in, in, the, in the scripts first. Yeah, same with me. Um, and I think, I, I look at that even different. I look at Enoch even different than uh, Yasher and Jubilee. My Isha is reading through Yasher right now. And um, it's an easier read because it's more of an historical account and it does read alongside of the first, first up until Joshua in scripture. Um, I think Enoch is especially the book that'll have you looking for some new revelation. And I also agree that we should be firming Torah, at least the first five books of the Bible before you get, and really all of it, but at least that before you get into it, because we've seen, um, if you peel at some of these uh, weird doctrines in and out of the truth of the world, a lot of it stem to not understanding fully Enoch. Like a lot of a lot of these doctrines of the world stem back to Enoch. So I definitely agree. Yahakana, it's on you. Shalom. This is actually Mana. Um, I didn't get to join in on this uh this call this time around, but um I wanted to ask, uh, as you guys do your closing out prayer, that um, you guys also pray for me. Um, I got a message today from my job that they are now mandating the vaccine. And in California, most of you might know, but we don't do exemptions. Um, there is no exemption in California. And so I was getting you know, told by uh, a coach to just um to still send in the exemption letter to my hr anyway but um and again it's not even me saying that uh you know the father cannot do uh or cannot allow me to fight against my job in this and to keep my job but um it's kind of one of those things where i already know you know this is this is the time that we coming into so if you know so be it i gotta lose my job i gotta lose my job it's, it's nothing but um, to, you know, keep me in prayer over that. No question, no question. Um, and to your point about the videos, I'm actually going to, I was trying to wait till we got to 30, but man, that may be, man. Matter of fact, ain't no question, that's going to be next year sometime. So <laughs> these first 20 chapters, I am going to dump on the YouTube between tonight and tomorrow. Um, so if you want to go back and check them out, I know your mother knows the YouTube or whatnot. So you can go back and check this out. Um, and that's for you too, Akif. I know some things you want to revisit so you can make sure you get the notes on them um, between tonight and tomorrow because it's going to take a few minutes. But we'll keep you in prayer, Akoti. I'll be, I definitely got you. Um, I'll text it to you, y'all, Rick. It'll be easier for me. Um, but um. I'm thankful, man, that all y'all come, you know. Uh, I really didn't know what to expect with this, but I think this is good. Um, to the Ox point, how he was talking about these books and being versed in Torah, I think it's even better that we can build in it as a group too. That way we can bounce ideas off each other. Um, and, uh, you know, um, I think that's just better. You know, really, when I think about it, you know, I'm, I'm a weird dude, but I think about the way we build in these type of group settings the same way that the, 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 the scriptures are written, right? Each prophet and really the entire book is always a piece of something. I can't really think of anywhere in scripture other than really when Yahushua talks because he is the word, but almost everywhere else, it's a piece. So you get a piece in Ezekiel, you get a piece. And there's so much to know, but there's always a piece to something, a piece to something, a piece in Daniel, a piece in, you know what I'm saying, Deuteronomy, a piece in Genesis, a piece in Joshua or Yahushua or Yahushua, I should say, a piece in, it's always a piece. The Bible is, and then you get to Revelation and Jude. And then when you read the Bible in its entirety, and I'll be, I'll, we pray that he gives us understanding we put it all together and that's really how we see prophecy in the Bible. That's how we make it make sense. So being that we are the chosen children of Yasharal, the chosen people of Abiyah, and um, you know, I don't know what nobody does on their personal life in here, but I believe that everybody on the call is trying um, 
is trying to walk right with Abia, right? So this what we do, and what we do is <laughs> that's funny. Of course, you definitely mean you. Hallelujah. But what we do here, I see this the same way the Bible is written. So Keith has a piece, Oxam has a piece, Yahakana has a piece, Lauren has a piece, DJ has a piece, Pakai Yahoo, I think he just jumped out, but he'll have a piece. And then we bring it together the same way the, the, the scripture was written, like the prophets. And that's how we can get true understanding. I, I know, for example, myself, because my mind is, is I, 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 we've discussed this before, when I read the scriptures, it's like a movie playing out to me and I see it like that, right? I just, sometimes I just close my eyes and I see the scene. But from being on different calls, I may hear Kiefer to say something that'll add a piece to the scene for me. And I'm like, okay, that's the part that was missing. Or even Netanyahu, he's good for that as well. You know, um, and that's why it's good that we're able to do this because I I, I feel like Abiyah is building us up to go through his truth the same way he had his scriptures written. I'm going to give Lauren a piece. I'm going to give Kiefer a piece. I'm going to give Yarik a piece. And then when they get together, they'll be able to see my prophecy more full. Now, through the piece I give them all, they'll be able to understand the gist of it. But to get to the root of it, they're going to have to sit down and fellowship, not fellowship together, fellowship together with me by having the fellowship with my word being out and that being what they fellowship in. So I see these calls exactly like that. Abiyah is like writing the scripture. He's giving us understanding of the prophecy the same way he had the prophecies written. And that's why this is good. And I also agree with you, Mira, when we do it in this setting, you know, if any of us are to go too far left field. And I, I like that it's a respect of all opinions, but if any of us, you know, if y'all see me start veering off like I'm not messianic because of something Enoch said, man, definitely reel me back in. <laughs> You know, don't let me go. And I've seen in different camps and situations in the awakening where books like this Enoch, without true understanding of the foundation, I won't even say you have to completely understand script, but you have to understand the foundations of scripture and what y'all are saying. I've seen where those type of doctrines come from, um, these type of things, just on, on a more scientific worldly level, NASA and a lot of the space programs of the earth and all of that stem from their ignorance and what they believe about these books of Enoch, you know? So it definitely happens, you know? And that's why I say Toda Rabbah, as I, as I go into prayer to just take us out since it's getting late, Toda Rabbah to Abiyah for allowing us, for peace, putting us together and piecing together his word for us in the same way that he pieced together his word for us, right? Hallelujah. Like Yah is so on time all the time. He's piecing us together the same way he pieced the word together to begin with, to give us understanding of the word. And we say, Toda Rabah for everybody on the call that you are allowing your Ruach and allowing your light to shine through us all. Um, we know that we are an unclean people as we come into your truth, Abiyah. Some have been in longer than others, but I still just pray that you have mercy on us all, Father Yah, that you forgive us of our sins that we commit knowing and unknowingly. And that you continue to have patience with us, Father Yah, as you search our hearts as only you know it. Um, and you know that we are trying, I'll be honest. A lot of things that still hold us back. Um, there are things that we don't completely understand that we are even wrong. And we just ask that you continue through, your, through, through being the merciful Elohim that you are, that you continue to correct us, Father, um, and lead us on this ancient path. Hallelujah. We pray that you send your light, which is Yahushua HaMashiach, the lamp, the lamb, um, to make all our crooked paths straight and to guide us, Father Yah, in darkness, in this shadow of death, for he has gotten the victory over death, and we know that he is more than capable of handling his father's business, which is yours, which you have sent him here to do. Um, we pray for a Koti Mana Abiyah, a mighty woman of Zion, a young woman, who you are building in your truth, Abiyah, who you are, um, who in conversation you have given something special, Abiyah, who, 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 who labors in your word and who yearns to understand you. And we know that you say you'll bless those who bless um, your chosen and you'll curse those who curse thee. And we just ask you, Abiyah, that um, you be with her in this hour and wherever you see fit for her to be, Abiyah, that we'll trust your will and we'll trust your word. And we know that you'll put her where she needs to be, Abiyah. And if it be your holy will that she stay put, Abiyah, we know that you'll make a way. Whether California takes exemptions letters or not, 
we know that the ultimate exemption letter is if you speak. For the scripture says that who you who you hold up, no man can tear it down. The scripture says that those in your hand, no man can pull them out. Hallelujah. So we know that you will put her where she needs to be. Um, we pray that same prayer for her mother and her family. I'll be out that you just guide them on your path. Um, you stay with them. You have mercy on their household, Father Yah. You protect them. You lead them righteously, Abiyah. We pray for Akels, Abiyah, that you work on him, Abiyah. You forgive him of his sins and you help him to reconcile with his family, Abiyah, and that they can all grow together in your word. For as I heard my Akifa say on his lesson recently, we don't want to see anybody. We don't want to see anybody not make it into your glorious um, abode. And we just pray that you have that mercy, Abiyaz. We just read in this Enoch. We don't want to see anybody go into that darkness. It's a scary place. I believe that's why you've given us this to read this, to make sure that we have the proper reverence and fear for you, um, knowing that we don't want to be there, but also rejoicing and knowing that you are calling us so that we aren't there and calling us so that we can help others. And we see that on your Hakanah, Mana, and also Akels, Abiyaz. We just ask that you have mercy on them um, and you let your light shine on them. And, Teach them all things and let your Ruach reveal all things, Abiyah, so that they can be what you have called them all to be, which are functioning vessels in your temple and, and in your tabernacle um, to do your work and to do your bidding and, and all things to give you glory and let your light and let your glory be seen. Um, and we trust that word, Abiyah. We trust that you will make a way for them and for us all. Um, for I believe that the exemption letters, some of us have passed them, some of us has got them in and got it and got it done, some of us haven't, but it just looks like we're in a time as they continue to shock value this world with their variants. The day is coming where all of us may be in a situation where there is no, no state will take one and we still will give you all honor, glory and praise in that moment, knowing that you will always have the final say with the house of Yasharal. Hallelujah, we give you um, reverence, Abiyah. We thank you for your only begotten son, which is the word made flesh, and who came here to teach us these words, to teach us these scriptures. And even in his absence physically, spiritually, he's still revealing all things because of the Ruach you sent in the world in his name. And we ask in his name that your Ruach is upon us all tonight. I ask that your Ruach is upon our DJ as he studies the Ezekiel and he ties it together with this Abiyah that you reveal what he's worthy to see, what any of us is worthy to see. I ask that you continue to uh, just be our mighty Elohim in this hour, Abiyah, of uncertainty, but we are certain that we have you. And as Revelation chapter two, verse nine say, you see our poverty and our tribulation, but thou art rich. Why are we rich? We're rich because we have you and everything in the world and everything of creation. You have the keys to creation, so you control all things. Um, we ask that you open up the health of our body and all our children, Abiyah, and you just make us strong and give us focus and endurance in this time so that we can go out and do this work and be all that you've called us to be, Abiyah. Teach us to be better brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, husbands and wives, um, uncles and aunties, nieces and nephews, cousins, Abiyah. Teach us to be better. Teach us not to backbite. Teach us not to murmur and blaspheme or teach us not to gossip about each other. Teach us to be merciful towards each other for the only way for us to be forgiven by you is we have to be forgiven. Um, show us where we're right and show us where we're wrong so that we can correct ourselves even when we think we're right. Let every man know that he knows nothing. Hallelujah. Save for you. Save for Yahushua. And we just ask that you continue to lead us righteously on this path, Abiyah, in the name of Yahushua HaMashiach. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. 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 <laughs> I'm put that document um, in the yeah. chat. So that's, that's work for, you know, many of us. I know we're entering in a different time and it, it may not still... Um, have the same effectiveness that it had before, but that's um, that's what that's what I use, and um, I'll definitely also be keeping in my prayers. We got to get Mana, man. 
Akifa Minaj showed me something about the Song of Solomon. Like I told you earlier, I always know, um, and I humbly say this, but I read a lot of scripture or not as much now because my daughter be like, no, <laughs> she'd be running interference. But back when I had that moment, like two years ago and two years prior to that, I used to just read. I told you that before, I, I would just read. So from reading so much and everything, as Mira would always say about the extra books, I read quite a few things. But with that being said, whenever I hear somebody now and they go over something that I knew, but I see it away, I'm like, yeah, that Ak was studying or that Akoti was studying. And I seen that with your lesson when you talked about Rachel. And a lot of times we just look at Rachel and it's like, you know, Jacob loved her. That's Yosef's mother, end of the story. But you showed where she might have still been tangling with them idols, right? Which is something that's like we know, but we never really put that face on it. And when you did your lesson, I was reading and I was like, yo, that was really dope. Like I never really thought about it like that. And then once you do it now, I'm back in the scripture. Like, well, let me see, man, what this Ock was talking. You know what I mean? Even you my Ock, but I still even go scrutinize you. Like, let me see what Ock talking about, right? And I felt you. I say that to say, and you know, this is part of the reason why we pray so hard from, from my nah. My nah was talking to me about Song of Solomon and I've read Song of Solomon and typically people can't understand Song of Solomon because it's just like a loaded book, period. And she said something to me and I had a moment with her about a month ago and I was like, man, I never thought of that, you know? And, I, and, 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 and then as I was praying for her and praying on it, y'all was just like, man, I got 7,000 prophets who ain't bowed to me. You ain't the only one. <laughs> hey, yo. Uh. So I just Trust say, hallelujah to but nah, man, you're going to be okay, man, because I see what Yah has given you in scripture, and I understand that he don't just get that to the faint of heart. He don't just give that to nobody who ain't worthy. So, you know, the yeah. God, you I give, talked to Manah a while back, and um, be blessed. My, my bad, I can't. I talked to Manah a while back and realized that she's reading it on a different level. Like, she's reading it... She, She's reading it on a different level now. So I know she's definitely in that vein. She, she showed us a couple of things before. Hallelujah. Ox Sam, I view the same way. And I view everybody on this call that way, though. I've seen everybody. But just speaking of the younger folks on here, Ox Sam, as soon as I met you at Sukkot, I was just hearing some things you were saying, and I was like, you know what, in truth, because I'm like 20 years older than you, and I say this humbly, but in truth, as I heard you talk, I was thinking like, Man, that ox sounds just like me. <laughs> For real. And you know, oh, people, praises. Oh, people praises, yeah. about me like this drag me somewhere everywhere. When I was listening to you, I was like, that's my kind of ox right there. But I just see the future of this thing, man. I'll be y'all doing something special, man, with y'all, man. I say that to you and Manak, I look both y'all the same. Man. I'll be y'all doing something special with this next generation of Israel. And I'm just happy to be able to be a part of it in any way I can help. Um, even if it's just prayer, because we know that's our greatest weapon. I'm here. Hallelujah. Oh, praise to you. Thank you so much for that. Hallelujah. Yeah. Um, I, Sam, I'm telling you, same way. When I heard him, I was like, the scariness is the calmness of his voice when he's talking about the work. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, all praises to the Father, you know. Um, it. <laughs> I'm like, literally when I was getting the message and I was sitting there and I was like, like the hesitancy to panic, I was like, wait, 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 hold on, no. You know, stay put, chill out, pray, of course. But the, I guess the thing that boggled my mind so much was that I was like, you know, this ain't the, I was talking to a coworker of mine and she just kept telling me every which way, like, um, no, well, it's, this is all all states, this, that, and the third. And I was like, well, wherever I got to go, I was like, I'd rather, you know, before I compromise my beliefs, I'd rather die or be homeless or, you know, be without before I compromise my beliefs at, at any cost. And um, just kept getting more backlash to what I was saying. And I was like, you know, I put my phone down and I was like, yeah, I've, I've made the hard decision before. I'd make it again and again and again. So, hallelujah hallelujah I don't hallelujah i don't see you going without a coat see i'll be honest and say i'm waking y'all up to make you go without i don't see that 
Hallelujah. Making the way. Hallelujah. So shalom, shalom, everybody. Layla Tov. Um, as usual at this hour, I hear my daughter downstairs turning up. <laughs> so I got to go get to so. it, man. Ain't no tell her what she got my house looking like. Y'all have a good evening. You too, Layla Tov. I have a Layla Tov, I can. Good evening. Layla Tov. Layla Tov.